There are three things that are really scaring me right now. One of them is North Korea. Everyone knew that dealing with North Korea was not going to be a Republican or a Democratic issue and that the new president was going to have to do that. But I have dear friends that have family in Seoul, Korea, and it frightens me that the decision of putting people in South Korea, Japan, and the citizens of North Korea in harm's way resides solely in the hands of two people. The second thing that frightens me, scaring me right now, is Charlottesville. I was out of town as our church was dealing with the aftermath of Charlottesville. And as a leader of a community bent on ridding the earth of hate and discrimination, as we extend the love of the kingdom of God, it frightens me that there still exists so much racial strife in this country. Not that all racism was gone, that wasn't my presumption, but I hate it that we have black kids and teenagers in this church that have to grow up watching newsreels with images of white supremacy, and if they're not quite sure where the rest of the culture stands on inequality. The third thing that really scares me right now is the number of dear Christian friends I've seen in the last two decades abandon their Christian faith. The sort of almost avant-garde, hipster feel on social media of people in the, the millennials sort of feeling that I can reject Christianity and sort of stay spiritual is frightening. The Bible is very clear that as the years go by and as we get closer to the Lord's return, whenever that may be, that people are going to start turning their backs on Him. Jesus said in Mark chapter 13, false messiahs and prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Paul said in Timothy, the Spirit clearly says that in latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. The Apostle Paul, when he was meeting with leaders for the very last time of a church in ancient Turkey, he said, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not, sep will not spare the flock. Elsewhere, Paul warned, mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, boastful, proud, ungrateful, unholy, not lovers of the good, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. Elsewhere, he said, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, you keep your head in all situations. Now, the problem is it's hard to keep your head in all situations when people that are rejecting the Christian faith are Christians that are friends of yours, family members, co-workers, kids, parents. That's hard to keep your head. You start seeing ridiculous posts on Facebook feeds, conversations with people who five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, were very devout, strong Christians. And now you're like, what's going on? And you're thinking to yourself, I need to say something, but our culture has hardwired us to think that if we truly love someone, we're not going to say anything because that would be judgmental. Calling them to account because it's true would still be judgmental. So we Christians are sort of chained into saying nothing. I have a pastor friend who left the faith. He came out on social media that he no longer believed in Jesus and the resurrection. Now, the person I'm talking about was the pastor of the church where I grew up as a kid. He told me, I don't believe in Jesus and the resurrection anymore. I was like, dude, you ordained me to be a pastor. What am I supposed to think of that? He was involved in weddings, baptized people. People that became Christians were like, am I still a Christian if the guy who baptized me isn't, isn't even a pastor, let alone believing in Jesus anymore? I said, of course you're fine. But through our congregation and a whole turmoil. It's hard to keep your head in situations like this because there's this tension as the scripture admonishes us to speak the truth 
in love. We must speak the truth in love. But the tendency within our culture is, if we speak the truth, even though it's in love, that's being judgmental, so we're not going to say anything under the guise of just loving someone. Well, you know people that have fallen away. I know people who have fallen away, and they all have one thing in common. They all say that we can't trust the Bible anymore, that it's just a book that it's just full of errors, that it's a human book of wisdom that was compiled, compiled by human beings and put together at an ancient, in an ancient culture. And it worked for them back then. But we've evolved to the point where we don't believe in fairy tales any longer. We are more developed than other people in our thinking. The people that have rejected Christianity, who used to be believers, they're now more mature than you. They've grown fast past the infancy worldview that you have. That is an ancient, ancient view of the way the world works. Every time I hear someone, and now it's unrelenting, every time I hear someone talk about how they used to believe in Jesus, but now they don't, reminds me of that great line from the Avett Brothers song, 10,000 words, ain't it like most people I'm no different. We love to talk on things we don't know about. Hold on. You do know who the Avert brothers are, right? Raise your hand if you don't listen to the Avert brothers. Hold it up high. Look around. Who raised you people? Were you not held at birth? When we leave today, I want you to play at Walkout this song by the Avett Brothers because we're going to learn you. We're going to learn you right. Here we go. Now, when people who used to be Christians spout off theories about the economy or politics, that's one thing. You don't want to hear me talk about economic theory and politics. But when people who have fallen away from the faith start sharing widely, and highly uninformed and inaccurate statements about the Bible, people who do what I do for a living are required to say something. The Bible says that pastors, elders, the, the shepherds of the church must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. I mean, I actually believe it. And they must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he may encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. And as someone required by God to stand up and encourage people by sound doctrine and to refute those who oppose it, I want you to know that despite everything that you're hearing from people that used to be Christians at work and online, that you do not stand on some teetering canoe ready to tip over at any moment by the latest discovery right by Time Magazine before Easter, but you're standing on a rock. You can base your life upon the God that reveals His purpose and will for the universe through His Word. I love what the great Christian philosopher Dallas Willard said. He said, we live in a culture that has for centuries now cultivated the idea that the skeptical person is always smarter than the one who believes. You can almost be as stupid as cabbage as long as you doubt. <laughs> and so we're starting a three-week series today simply called The Word. And what we're going to do is we're going to answer three questions. What is the Bible exactly? We're going to talk about some things you probably have never heard in church before next week in a good way. We're going to talk about why do false teachers attack it? What are the motivations of, or what the Bible calls, false teachers or false prophets? And today what we're going to do is we're going to answer the question, can I trust the Bible? And this is more than a mere academic exercise, and I want you to write down what I'm sharing with you. I want you to share it with your kids. I want you to share it with your teenagers. I want you to have the facts. And so what I want to do is I'm going to talk first about manuscript evidence. We can trust the Bible because of the manuscript evidence. Now, uh, a while ago, um, the, the, TV, the talk show host, Larry King, was interviewing uh, a lady by the name of Shirley MacLaine. Um, very, very popular back in the 80s and 90s. 
And a, a Christian called into the program and asked a question and quoted a verse from the New Testament. Well, Shirley MacLaine laughed and brushed it off and said, well, you know, the Bible's been changed and translated so many times over the last 2,000 years. It's impossible to have any confidence in its accuracy. And then King quickly laughed, well, everyone knows that. Really? Does, really, does everyone know that? In order to determine whether or not something is trustworthy, you have to compare it you have to compare the Bible to other ancient documents. And there are a number of ancient manuscripts where scholars regard them with a high degree of certainty and accuracy. For instance, I want you to write this down. Thucydides wrote his book, Histories. Somewhere around, they, they, the best guess is around 480 B.C., right around there, give or take 50 years or so. The earliest copy, so it was written 480 B.C., the earliest copy we have is 900 AD. The length of time between the time it was written and the actual earliest copy we have is 1,300 years. And there are only eight copies. Tacitus, his Annals of the Imperial Rome, one of the great chief classical sources for the Roman world at the turn of the new millennia. And his book, Annals, written at sometime around 100 A.D. It took a few years to put this thing together. The earliest copy we have is 1100 A.D., which means there was 1,000 years between the time it was written and our earliest copies, and there are only 20 ancient, ancient copies. Caesar, writing the Gaelic Wars, around 100 to 44 B.C., right around there, give or take, uh, 50 years or 10 years or so for that one. The earliest copy around 900 A.D., 1,000 years, and there are only 10 ancient copies. Herodotus is history, 480 B.C., 900 A.D. is the earliest copy, 1,300 years between the time it was written and our earliest copy, and there are only eight, eight ancient manuscripts. The most evidence in the ancient world in terms of manuscript evidence is for Homer's Iliad, written 900, somewhere around there, B.C., earliest copy we have, a little piece, 400 B.C., the span between when it was written and the earliest copy we have is 500 years. In the ancient world, a staggering amount of manuscript evidence, we have 643 ancient manuscripts. This is why F.F. Bruce said that no classical historian would listen to an argument that the authenticity of Herodotus or Thucydides is in doubt because the earliest manuscripts of their works which are of any use to us, are over 1,300 years later than the original. When I'm in a PhD course at Princeton going through Plato's Symposium, not once did we ever say, I wonder if Plato actually ever said this. No one doubts that. But now suddenly Larry King and Shirley MacLaine and your aunt and your buddy on Facebook is an authority on the reliability of the New Testament documents. Let's compare the ancient documents to what the actual evidence is. The New Testament written anywhere, 51 AD, the book of Thessalonians, to 95 AD. The earliest copy that we have, the John Ryland's papyrus, around 130, 117 to 150, around that time, less than 100 years exists between the original and the first extant copy that we have, and there are over 5,000 ancient copies. Ain't it like most people? I'm no different. We love to talk on things we don't know about. One of my heroes in the faith is a man who passed away in 2007. His name was Dr. Bruce Metzger. One of the reasons I wanted to go to Princeton Seminary was to simply be around this great scholar and this man of faith. He literally was the most brilliant man on campus, a genius among geniuses. But anyone that ever met or studied with Dr. Metzger knew he was the most self-effacing, gracious man you would ever meet. You would come out of the library or you would come out of the cafeteria and someone would say, well, that guy Bruce was really nice. He's this old dude like walks around a library and talks to students. And I'm like, 
you do know who he is, right? In the history of the Christian faith, there have been three people who would be widely acclaimed to be the worldwide experts on what, the, what is called textual criticism, the documents of the New Testament, and you just had lunch with them. But that's the kind of guy that he was. Now, um, uh, Lee Strobel, in writing his book, The Case for Christ, which is a, a great read, I would encourage you to read it, sat down with Dr. Metzger because the New Testament is so attacked so often. And he asked about the comparison of the New Testament text to other ancient manuscripts, like Tacitus or Homer's, uh, Homer's Iliad. And I want you to listen to Dr. Mesker's response, because this is how a genius, the world's authority, talks in a measured tone. People who are actual authorities don't speak in hyperbole and overstatements. How does the New Testament stack up against well-known works of antiquity, Strobel asked. Dr. Metzger, extremely well. We, we can have great confidence in the fidelity with which the material has come down to us, especially compared with any other ancient literary work. The quantity, and this is, just to hear him say this, to hear his voice, the quantity of the New Testament material is almost embarrassing in comparison with other works of antiquity. Now, when you're talking to Bill in accounting at your work about how unreliable the Bible is, please understand, there are people that you should listen to and there are people that you shouldn't listen to. Dr. Metzger is one that you should. Strobel then asked Metzger if scholarship basically has hurt his Christian faith. Has it destroyed it, being around so many skeptics and being on the firing line of the ancient documents and reconstructing them. And, and, and he said, this is his response. Oh, it has increased the basis of my personal faith to see the firmness with which these materials have come down to us with a multiplicity of copies, some of which are very, very ancient. And then Strobel jumped in and he asked him, well, did, did all of this dilute your faith? Did it hurt your faith in any way? And Metzger interrupted him and said, oh, on the contrary, it has built it. I've asked questions all my life. I've dug into the text. I've studied this thoroughly. And today, I know with confidence that my trust in Jesus has been well placed. And then he said, very well placed. That's manuscript evidence. Let's talk about historical evidence really fast. I could go on and on and on and talk about historic. Let me just give you a couple instances. A lot of people will say we should follow the moral, moral teachings of Jesus and let's be like really active socially and we'll be really loud. And, uh, but basically, we're not going to listen to anything that was said about Jesus, about the nature of, of who he was, his nature, and what he was doing. We'll just listen to his teachings. Because, and this is what they say, Human beings have taken Jesus and turned him into the third person of the Trinity, into a deity. They've taken a man, turned him into a god. Well, what does the evidence say? The earliest gospel that we have is the Gospel of Mark, written in the mid-60s, 65 to 70, around there. In the Gospel of Mark, there are 19 miracles. Now, you would think if the early church was simply creating this guy who was handing out miracles like a politician, by the time the last gospel rolled around, there would be hundreds of miracles. But what's, what's the actual evidence? The Gospel of John, written 85 to 95 AD, has hundreds of miracles? Seven miracles. Seven. Who are you actually listening to when people are... Th what, what is the basis? What is the evidence of this? Here's the question. Doesn't the Bible contradict history? How many of you have ever been to Salt Lake City? As many people that like the Avett brothers, evidently. <laughs> uh, we were going to uh, Yellowstone one year, and we, we thought we would take a quick little detour through Salt Lake City. And uh, we went to Salt Lake City, beautiful temple. 
I love people who are Mormons. They're very, very moral. Uh, they're hardworking people. They're family-oriented people. And they believe an absolutely crazy book that has no basis in history. The Book of Mormon describes a vast ancient civilization here in North America between 600 B.C. and 400 A.D. in great detail. All these cities and people and language and all this. Now, the problem is, none of it actually exists. None of it exists. And most Mormons believe the Book of Mormon lock, stock, and barrel. We serve a God that has preserved his word, and his word is true, and you can listen to the Bible when it talks about marriages and parenting skills and life in the future and the afterlife, in part because it rings true, but in part because when you can compare it historically, it stands up to history. For instance, in the Old Testament, there was a group of people called the Hittites. Have you heard of the Hittites? Read through the Old Testament, you, you, the Hittites. Turn to your neighbor and say Hittites. That's a great name, right? Don't you love those names in the Old Testament? Well, when the Bible talked about the Hittites, historians, by and large, had a problem with the Hittites because there wasn't any other record in the ancient world of the Hittites. So they thought, well, the, it's obviously, if it's only in the Bible, then you are making it up, right? Our historians would say, we have to question the accuracy of this because there's no other corroboration historically. Then in 1906, some archaeologists were digging around and unearthed the capital city of the Hittite nation, and they kept on digging and found 40 different Hittite cities. In 1905, you were a moron if you believed that in the Hittites. In 1906, oh, well, actually, it turns out there actually are some Hittites. There, now let's talk about Belshazzar. In Daniel chapter 5, lean over and say Belshazzar, particularly if you're looking for a boy's name. Belshazzar. There was a guy named Belshazzar in Daniel chapter 5. Historians said King Belshazzar never existed, never showed up in the ancient Babylonian literature or in archaeological sites. So that's strange, because if you know anything about the Babylonians, they wrote a lot on clay tablets. So you're thinking, surely, if there is some guy named Belshazzar, he's going to show up somewhere, but he didn't show up anywhere until 1956. Archaeologists unearthed what is now called the clay cylinder of Nabonidus, where it said, quote, the king of Babylon left his son Belshazzar and put him on his throne. 1955, you were uninformed if you believe Daniel chapter 5 reflected history. But in 1956, suddenly, ah, okay, yeah, we can believe it. To date, there have been over 25,000 archaeological corroborations that substantiate the historical nature of the Bible. The Bible is nothing but a historical record at the very basis of God working in the lives of his people and delivering truth, which is why renowned Jewish archaeologist Nelson Gluck said, it may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. So there's manuscript evidence. We could talk all day about historical refer references. But the main reason most of us believe it is because it works. It just works. You would think that if God was going to inspire a book, number one, it would probably be the best-selling book in the history of the world, which it is. And it would actually work. People would look to it to change their lives, to help them become better people. Jesus said, when um, I am the light of the world, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And the reason you can believe in that it's because you can believe in the trustworthiness of the book that bears his name. Let me conclude by saying three things. Number one, I've lost my faith before. At the end of my first year in graduate school, I lost my faith. I didn't believe in Jesus. I didn't believe in the resurrection, the virgin birth. I spent six years sleepless months wrestling with my faith, I started to abuse cold medicine simply so I could get to sleep at night. I thought about taking my life. That's how serious it was. 
it was kind of too late to send in the law school applications by that point in my life. I felt like I have ruined my life. And now I have believed a lie. I understand your doubts. I've walked back from those doubts based on truth, based on evidence. I remember calling up a mentor of mine, Dr. Stephen Pattison. I said, Dr. Pattison, I feel like I'm in the middle of this. I feel like I'm at the Jersey Shore and I'm standing at the water's edge and so far for the last eight years, the water going over my feet has felt wonderful. Following Jesus has been great. But now, the water is going back out. And I said, if you've ever been, Dr. Patterson, to the Jersey Shore, when the water goes back out to the ocean, you start sinking and sinking and sinking. I'm not a crying person. I lost it in my kitchen. I said, Dr. Patterson, it keeps, I keep going down and down and down and down. I keep sinking and sinking and sinking. And many of you have been there before. Maybe not over the evidence of the Bible, but your life feels like I keep sinking and sinking and sinking. He said, Brian, I've been there before. I've been exactly where you've been standing. I have felt the wonderful uh, nature of the water coming up over my field, and I felt the sand going down below. And you're going to discover that when the last grain of sand is gone, Brian, you're standing on a rock. You need to understand that. The reason you can get through hard times is because the Bible is not this fairy tale book. It's real people, real life, and it will help you. Number two, stop listening to people who have no idea what they're talking about. Can I tell you, I spent eight years of rigorous study on Greek, okay? I'm having a conversation with a friend, Chris. He's a pastor in Michigan. He said a woman came to his church, said, I'm leaving because you don't believe this and this and this. And there's this Greek word, and it really means this. And he's sort of like is biting his tongue. This woman who has never studied Greek is now going to leave the faith over the meaning of this word. And we just started laughing and then became silent over how sad it is. You need to understand. I spent eight years of my life studying Greek. I don't know the first thing about ancient Greek. I've studied Koine Greek, Attic Greek. I don't know the first thing about Greek. Don't listen to me. My professors were amazing. And their professors were amazing. Don't listen to me about Greek. I know nothing. So when people start spouting off information about Greek words, I just want to take back. I'm like, you don't understand what you're talking about. You seriously have no idea what you're talking about. The arrogance with which you approach God's word and what he's doing in the world, it hurts people. This overstatement that you have when you're approaching these things. Number three, please understand this about Christianity. We don't love people because they're Christians. We love people because we're Christians. You understand? People of a different skin color, socioeconomic status, that their belief about gender, their belief about sexuality, they're atheists, they're ag- it doesn't matter who they are. We love everybody, not because they're Christians, but because we're Christians. That's what we do, especially for people who are struggling with their faith. So I don't know what you've been doing, I don't know what you've been thinking. I don't know what you've been wrestling with. I want you to understand that you're going to be standing on a rock, and we want you to know that this is a safe place for you to come with your questions. We're not going to judge you. We're not going to cast you out. We're going to wrestle through this together because that's what it means to be Christians. We welcome everyone with open arms. Let's pray. Our God, our Father, we thank you that you don't kick us out because of our doubts. We thank you that you don't shun us because of our differences. We thank you that you can take a punch. We thank you that you can handle our doubt. We thank you that in the middle of a, of, of a, of a, of a room where we're receiving chemotherapy, you can take it when we lash out at you because you know our hearts, you love us, you accept us. And so, God, we pray that you would help us to be humble people, gracious people, 
kind people. Faith, no faith, belief, no belief. We pray that we would love the world because we are your children, not because they are your children. We pray with open arms we would welcome anyone because of what you have done for us on the cross. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching today's message. For more practical resources to help you and your family, please go to Brian's website at brianjones.com.